Well, I think we can start. I'm Dominic Tarpey. I'm on the committee that helps put together these particular grand rounds. Uh, this is the intensive services grand round series here at the UCSF Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences. So welcome to you all to today's grand rounds. And I think folks will just stay on mute and there'll be an opportunity to, to raise questions. I'll keep an eye on the chat and uh, so that any questions that come through that way uh, posed to our speaker. Our speaker today is Josiah Stickles. Josiah Stickles is the Clinical Administrative Director of Adult Intensive Services here at Langley Porter. And that includes managing the partial hospitalization and intensive outpatient programs at Langley Porter. In addition to oversight of the rehabilitation services for the adult inpatient unit and here at Langley Porter as well. So Josiah is a graduate of the California Institute of Integral Studies and he has a master's degree from there in counseling psychology uh, with a concentration in drama therapy. So in addition to being a licensed marriage family therapist here in California, he's also a registered drama therapist and board certified trainer, and also the current president of the North American Drama Therapy Association. I could say more uh, about Josiah. He's a great colleague and uh, we're uh, fortunate to have him here today speaking about um, this unique level of care in mental health and psychiatry. So with no further ado, I will turn it over to Josiah. Thank you. Great, thanks Dom. <clears throat> uh, so welcome everybody, thanks for joining us today. Uh, so I'm gonna give an overview of our partial hospitalization program and our intensive outpatient program here at Langley Porter. But I also wanted to take a step back and provide that in context to uh, overall mental health treatment to give everybody a clear picture of where our programs land and where PHP and IOP programs land in general when we're uh, treating patients, when, when maybe some of you are referring patients. Uh, so that's kind of the need that we're trying to fill here uh, with this next hour. Uh, a little disclaimer that uh, I have no conflicts of interest in giving this presentation. Uh, I work here. This is part of my normal duties as uh, overseeing the PHP and IOP here at Langley Porter. I'm not getting uh, any extra compensation for this uh, or any other sponsorship. Uh, and as Dom mentioned, this is a part of the intensive services grand round series where we're really looking at trying to offer up uh, information and, and uh, sometimes practical uh, tools and techniques that are specific to intensive services. And for those of you who don't know, intensive services falls within the Department of Psychiatry and Langley Porter Psychiatric Hospital and Clinics in uh, encompassing the adult inpatient program, the partial hospitalization program, and the intensive outpatient program. So. Uh, the population that we're serving with those three programs is uh, on the higher level of acuity. Uh, and we'll, of course, be talking more about that as part of the continuum of, of care that I'll be discussing. So I wanted to uh, also frame uh, some of the learning objectives you may have saw, seen in the, in the poster that was circulated. Uh, first, uh, as I've been already mentioning, giving a, a context to the PHP and IOP. Where does that fall in, in this continuum or this spectrum of mental health care? Uh, I also would like to really emphasize the difference between a PHP and an IOP. Uh, when I think of frequently asked questions I get about the two programs, uh, that's that's what I was keeping in mind when I was kind of thinking about what to discuss today. Uh, and it's it's uh, for some very clear, and for for many it's not clear what the difference is between the two. And uh, in some ways, there's some misnomers here with intensive outpatient versus partial hospitalization. It kind of is confusing. So I I am coming in with uh, that understanding and, and wanting to leave. Uh, everybody here with a little bit clearer of an understanding. So that's our goal. 
And then lastly, uh, more specific to Langley Porter is uh, how to refer patients here um, and what that process looks like. So those will be the topics that we're trying to cover. You can let me know by the end of the hour if we achieved our goal. I wanted to start off with levels of care uh, as we're thinking about a continuum here with mental health treatment. Uh, and when I was reviewing this at the last minute, I was thinking about kind of the first line of defense in terms of making sure that we have good mental health is self-care. So if I were thinking about uh, a non-clinical discussion, if I was just talking to uh, friends and family, I would probably emphasize self-care as the first pillar of a continuum of care and a level of care is uh, taking inventory of that. Uh, and then when we approach crises or maybe our resiliency isn't as high as, uh, as it might be to be able to handle a crisis, that's when we start to look at uh, more professional services. And that's more the focus of this particular presentation. So levels of care, if we're thinking about um, professional interventions, I always like to think about it similar to in medicine. And since we're a part of a hospital, part of UCSF Health and part of Langley Porter Hospital, uh, it's helpful to think about mental health treatment like medicine in that you don't want to do too much. You want to try to do the least invasive procedure that's going to be the most effective. And that really, that idea, I think, can really help differentiate the PHP and the IOP. Just keep that concept in mind. So I put together this inverted triangle to have us think about uh, the continuum here. And what I based the most uh, intense intervention to the least intense intervention was based on time, based on the structure of, of the program, and what sorts of interventions are happening. So you'll see at the top of the ranking there is an inpatient hospital or perhaps a residential. So if we're thinking about time and interventions and structure, those are essentially 24-7 facilities. So uh, you can't get much higher up on the spectrum of interventions than every single day, every hour of the day. So that would, that would be the, the first and, and most intense form of treatment. Uh, and then below that is the partial hospitalization. Uh, and here, our PHP, we often help people transition out of the hospital. That was the intention behind the design of a PHP, was to help people transition from recently being hospitalized. And sometimes the reverse of that, to uh, offer up services in lieu of being hospitalized, which uh, of course would be the most ideal scenario. Uh, and a lot of times we're able to accomplish that. After PHP, we start looking at IOP, less intensive, less amount of time commitment, uh, the interventions aren't as frequent, and it can often be a step down from PHP, or uh, one can also start directly at that level, and we'll, I'll try to clarify that again by the, the end of this talk. Below IOP is outpatient treatment, so what that would look like is weekly talk therapy, maybe weekly drama therapy with your neighborhood drama therapist, uh, and having a psychiatrist on board if, if medications are needed as an intervention. Uh, that would be considered outpatient level of care. And then, like I said, I, if I were to uh, edit this, I would put self-care uh, maybe down there at the foundation of that triangle there, that that's definitely something we always want to keep in mind, that it doesn't always have to be professional interventions. We want to uh, maintain our mental health on, on the regular. And as we're talking, uh, if questions come up, Dom's going to keep track of questions, so feel free to type those in. Uh, 
and we'll try to make this a little bit more engaging uh, toward the end if we have time to go over those. So PHP and IOP. I said oftentimes uh, people think of them as one and, and to the same. So I thought I might as well start out there. So how are PHP and IOP the same? Uh, and I like to think of our programs as a stool that we're holding up our patients on. And it's a three-legged stool. Uh, the first leg of the program would be the skills groups that we offer. So the program is, both programs are group-based. The skills that we're teaching in the different groups are very much geared towards various coping strategies, uh, really classic com concepts of CBT and DBT, and I'll go into that a little bit more, uh, but geared towards helping people address the symptoms that are leading to needing the extra support uh, by coming into the program. So that's the first leg. Uh, second leg would be working with an individual clinician. In our program, we call them primary clinicians because they wear many hats. They're at once your individual short-term therapist. They're uh, a group leader that you'll certainly see throughout your stay in the program. Uh, and they also uh, do case management. So they help uh, identify what you're working on while you're with us in the program. And then they, they make sure there's a plan in place for once the program's over. So that's the second leg of the stool. And then the third piece is uh, the psychiatrists that we have on staff. Uh, they, our psychiatrists, Dr. Woodard and, and Spivak, have decades of experience uh, offering medication interventions that can be really helpful uh, to help people in addition to the therapy that's involved in the program. So those are the, the three main pillars or uh, legs of the stool that I like to think about in, in terms of conceptualizing the program. So again, what do they have in common? Each program is different, but yes, they do have things in common. I put a little Venn diagram here to, uh, for us to think about where do they intersect here. Uh, I, I had, have mentioned that they're still considered outpatient services for adults, even though they're on the higher level of, of intervention. It's still a matter of the patient is going home in the evenings. It's a, both of the PHP and IOP are voluntary programs. Uh, so there, we're still considering them outpatient treatment. And, and now we're starting to see where the confusion lies because uh, it's not outpatient in terms of weekly therapy or your every six week visit with your psychiatrist. Uh, it's every day, but it, it's still, uh, just a number of hours in the day. Both programs are group-based, uh, and I mentioned that we really focus on skill building, uh, ways to enhance your ability to cope with stress, uh, ways to better manage the symptoms that you're coming in with. We treat a variety of uh, presentations in both the PHP and IOP, and in Langley Porter in particular, because we're uh, we have resources with being associated with UCSF Health. Uh, we are able to manage some of the more uh, significant situations that might arise for one. Uh, so that might include a mood disorder, bipolar disorder, um, various thought disorders. Um, and, and we also do uh, help people who are might be struggling with personality disorders and, and co-occurring mood disorders. Uh, the programs, both of them involve comprehensive evaluation. So we're going to take a, a pretty thorough history looking at uh, past psychiatric history, past medication trials, what current stressors is, is somebody coming into the program dealing with uh, so that we can really shape some, some specific goals to work on while they're in the program, and then also to inform what the aftercare program is. Oftentimes, people are coming in with pretty significant trauma histories, and we do recognize that we're not going to be able to necessarily uh, open up such a significant uh, situation, um, but we can think about 
what types of services need to be in place in the long run for that longer term work. So that's part of the evaluation process, the treatment itself, uh, helping bolster one's ability to tolerate distress, better recognize their emotional experience, be more mindful and present, uh, improve their relationships and communication. These are all things that we talk about uh, in the skills groups that we're running. Uh, and then post-treatment planning, we would we want to make sure that there's something in place after the program's over. Uh, and PHP IOP and our inpatient unit have kind of this, this a standard of making sure that there's a next appointment when the when somebody leaves our programs. And then medication management, of course. Uh, reach, research shows that uh, that patients. Uh, get the most effective treatment with a combination of medication interventions and psychotherapy. So that's really what we're trying to achieve here. What is the orientation of both programs? Both of them share a common curriculum. So that's another area where uh, the two share and it might be harder to tease out because they're not so distinct in, in what we're teaching. Uh, it's more a matter of the, the structure and, and the intensity of the intervention. So we base our curriculum in, in mindfulness and acceptance-based therapies. So that includes dialectical behavior therapy, as well as acceptance and commitment therapy. And then we'll also see more traditional cognitive behavioral therapy. And I can give kind of a, a brief spiel about uh, what what that means exactly. So cognitive behavioral therapy that's been around for probably the longest, or not probably, it has been around for the longest, and uh, basically it looks at one's thoughts, their behaviors, how to uh, intervene on that level. So uh, traditional practice in CBT might be a thought record, uh, identifying behaviors and then tracing back the thoughts that led up to the behavior and intervening in that way to, to then affect your emotional experience. What DBT did was then add a, a mindfulness component. So uh, to not invalidate one's experience that, uh, that it comes with the recognition that one's doing the best that they can and still might need to do a little bit more. That's the dialectical, uh, the acceptance, but also the change piece is kind of the core of DBT. I always make a disclaimer when I'm talking about the program using DBT that we're not a comprehensive DBT program. Uh, we have a wonderful comprehensive DBT program for young adults and adolescents uh, as part of Langley Quarter. Uh, and it's comprehensive in that it offers the, kind of the three components of DBT, which is uh, skills groups, individual therapy with phone coaching, uh, and it's longer term. So uh, there's also a family component to it. So comprehensive DBT is much more involved, it's much more longer term, uh, much more comprehensive. We more inform our curriculum with some of the core concepts involved in DBT. Uh, and then acceptance commitment therapy is a more modern approach, uh, still uh, incorporating mindfulness and acceptance into the therapy that we're using, uh, but, uh, but using a lot of metaphors to help address uh, what's bringing somebody into the program. What we'll also uh, see in the program is that we uh, incorporate, and I, and I have to get on my soapbox since I have everybody's attention, that uh, we incorporate a lot of creative arts therapies and drama therapy is a part of that. Uh, we, so we have myself on staff, we have uh, a few creative arts therapists, and also in our inpatient unit, we have a, a recreation therapist, we have another drama therapist, we have a music therapist. So we really try to incorporate some of the more traditional uh, therapeutic orientations with 
a more active approach. So people get to not only learn the concepts, but then get to practice them uh, and get on their feet or use music to integrate some of their learning. And we really find that it uh, does engage people more. Uh, it helps build relationships. It makes the groups more interactive. People aren't just sitting around uh, doing worksheets all day, but they're uh, actively committed to the treatment that they're enrolled in. And I think that really helps us get some pretty good results. Okay, so that's how they're the same. Now we're gonna talk about what differentiates the two. How do you separate out PHP from IOP? And I'll say that this is important because uh, a lot of times we'll get referrals where maybe the, the patient being referred doesn't know which program they want. And then uh, other times the referring provider doesn't know uh, which program the patient would best uh, be a better fit for. And again, that was part of the intention behind this presentation is uh, we would prefer that referrals come in with a clear recommendation at least. Of course, we'll take a second look and uh, do a, an assessment for that patient and see uh, where we think they land, uh, but it is helpful for them to come in with a, a clear recommendation. And it also helps us uh, build our programs. So it helps us have a clear understanding of what the demand is and where we're, where we're needing to grow our services. So I, I made this slide just for us to think about not mushing the two together, that it's not PHP slash IOP as in an either or situation. Uh, it's, it's not about getting the referral into whatever program happens to have availability in that particular moment. Uh, I really want us to think about the fact that PHP and IOP have really specific criteria. Uh, it's a little bit nuanced, but it, there is a clear distinction between the two. We'll start out with the partial hospitalization program. So when somebody is enrolling in the partial hospitalization program, it's because they need the, the highest level of care next to uh, being hospitalized. So that's kind of the clearest uh, delineation between the PHP and IOP. Uh, it means that somebody's on the verge of needing to be hospitalized. Uh, so they need a lot of structure. Uh, they need a lot of attention being paid, um, so a close set of eyes on them. Uh, it can often, as I mentioned, be a step down from an inpatient level of treatment. Uh, sometimes we get people coming from a residential facility uh, into the program, and it's really meant to help continue the treatment that may have been started in an inpatient unit, where now they're safe enough to go home in the evenings, but they still need a, some, some place to touch down every day. Uh, and have more structure uh, to help them get back on their feet. Uh, alternatively, somebody might be uh, almost needing to be hospitalized, but still able to keep themselves safe, to uh, structure their evenings, to be uh, more independent on the weekends, or maybe there's extra support that's helping bridge those gaps uh, and enabling them to participate in a PHP instead of being hospitalized or going to residential. And when I talk about safety, it's, it's uh, helpful to get really clear that we're talking about uh, suicidal ideation, somebody who might be struggling with having thoughts of wanting to harm themselves. Uh, and so something we want to keep a really close eye on, uh, and that's a clear indication that PHP would be the level of care that's warranted. Um, of course, because they're going home in the evenings and on the weekends, we do want them to be able to commit to keeping themselves safe. Uh, and at the same time, it'll be something that we would closely monitor and be able to monitor because we're uh, seeing them every day. So the PHP, just to summarize, uh, 
uh, it's an alternative to hospitalization. Uh, sometimes it's a transition from hospitalization or residential treatment. Uh, safety is a concern. So uh, most participants in a PHP are struggling with suicidal ideation with thoughts of wanting to harm themselves. The program structure for ours in particular, and some of them vary slightly depending on, uh, in terms of where the hours land, but uh, tend to be around this, the same amount of time uh, as in a, fu a full day. So like five to six hours, sometimes greater, like seven or eight, I've even seen. Ours runs Monday through Friday, starts at 10 and goes until three. Uh, and so we get to review all the different skills of DBT, and then we get to think about planning for the weekend on Fridays. Because it's an intensive program, the PHP is capped out at 10 participants. Uh, and that really enables us to have a more intimate experience to get to know each person in the group for each participant to be more supportive of each other. In fact, that's often the feedback we get is that the, yes, the thera therapists are great and the skills that they're learning is great, but the peer support that is offered is often one of the highlights that we hear back from patients as they go through the program. For our PHP, we, we like to see a length of stay of around 15 days. We want to have the person coming in consecutively. Uh, so 15 days, Monday through Friday, that bring you up to about three weeks. We do ongoing enrollment, so it, uh, it wouldn't necessarily be a Monday through Friday week each time. You could start on a, a Wednesday and end on a Tuesday. Uh, speaking of schedule, here's what a typical day looks like. Uh, you'd start out the morning with a uh, check-in group, which is our psychotherapy group. That's the uh, group that's less structured. It's more process-oriented. Everybody gets to talk about how they're doing that morning to reflect on the evening that they had. We, we like for current participants to set goals for themselves in the evening and then come in the next morning and talk about whether or not they were able to achieve those goals. If not, we have an opportunity to review what got in the way, what could be done differently. Uh, and then they set an intention for the day. So uh, what would they like to focus on throughout the day? And depending on the skills that are being taught, we might help hone in on something specific. Like if we're talking about uh, improving communication, uh, I might ask each person to think about a person that they wanna keep in mind in the skills group so that they have a little bit more real life application to what they're experiencing. So we'll go over skills groups at 11 and noon. Uh, often they relate or complement each other. And then we break for lunch. Uh, on site, we kind of have a social lunch uh, since we're doing things virtually. It's a virtual lunch hour. Uh, just recently, we're starting to uh, keep the telehealth meeting open so that participants can still uh, kind of come and go, get what they need for lunch, but still be on screen with others and use that time for more uh, informal connection. The last group of the day is at two o'clock and it's a skills practice or review group. And I mentioned that we incorporate a lot of creative arts therapies. And this is oftentimes where you would see uh, more of those influences where we might take a skill that you learned in the 11 o'clock group about communication styles and then at two o'clock you get to do role plays with somebody else in the group to practice what that would look like to be more assertive uh, for instance. All right so that was the PHP now we'll move on to the intensive outpatient program the IOP. And I mentioned that it's kind of a misnomer because uh, 
has the word intensive in there, and yet it's less intensive than the PHP. Uh, so again, I understand why the programs can be rather confusing when you're think of, thinking of them conceptually. The IOP uh, it can be a step down from PHP, as we saw in that inverted triangle. Uh, people can also refer directly into the IOP. So uh, that's often the case in, in where somebody might be seeing their therapist weekly, have a psychiatrist in place, and yet things don't seem to be improving on that outpatient basis. So that might be uh, a moment in time when, when the, the patient with their therapist decide, I think you need a little bit more support. Let's have you try the, this IOP out. And that would be a, a great example of when somebody might admit to the IOP. Uh, the symptom acuity, it's more on the moderate side of things. It's not to the, the intensity where uh, we're needing to see them every day. Uh, participants in the IOP can better structure their time outside of the program uh, because it's, uh, we'll go over the schedule in just a minute, it's every other day, it's a half day, uh, there's much more time where somebody would, would need to independently structure and uh, do okay. Uh, and then, as I mentioned in the PHP, oftentimes thoughts of suicide are something that a participant might be struggling with. For IOP, that's really uh, pretty much an exclusion criteria. We really try to uh, make sure that by time you get to the IOP level, uh, those sorts of thoughts have been uh, taken care of in terms of either a safety plan or uh, hopefully they've subsided. And if they haven't, that again, that there's a really strong safety plan in place so that uh, the participant feels comfortable, their, their family and social support network feels comfortable having the less structured intervention uh, and also the treatment team. So everybody has to be in agreement that uh, IOP level of care is, is appropriate. So I mentioned it's a step down from PHP. Uh, again, you can refer directly into the program. Uh, it's for more moderate levels of symptomology. Uh, I mentioned that it's only every other day, so they'll have a day off. They'll have much more time during the day and in the evenings and on weekends to need to be able to structure their time. So the ability to keep oneself safe is really important. Uh, currently, our programs run Monday, Wednesday, Friday. We offer a morning program from 9 to noon and then an afternoon program from one to four. Our group sizes go up just a little bit for IOP and we'll cap those out at 12. And the length of stay is typically four to six weeks. So it's a little bit more stretched out. And I try to think about that as an opportunity for people to be able to start to practice uh, some of the skills that they're picking up in the groups, uh, whereas PHP might be a crash course of all the basic DBT concepts and skills. IOP really lets you put those things into practice where you come in, you have a touch base about uh, particular coping strategies, and then you get the rest of the day, evening and the day off the following day to put those things into practice and then come in and check in with how it's going. This is what the schedule looks like for IOP. Morning groups, I mentioned, start at 9. You'll see a very sim similar uh, structure to the IOP, where there's a psychotherapy group first thing in the morning. And that really gives a chance for uh, people to not just ground themselves, but also offers that foundation of, OK, why am I here? What am I doing? What do I want to accomplish today? How are things going for me? That's the first group of the day, regardless of what program you're in, regardless of what time the program is set to start. So 9 o'clock for AM, 1 o'clock for PM, and then we do two skills groups. Uh, oftentimes they're related. And you'll see uh, that there's no uh, 
no skills practice group. And I, I mentioned that that's because they have the, the time off to put those skills into real world practice. So the expectation of IOP participants is that they're going to go out and try to put some of these things into practice in their own lives. So it's really relatable. Uh, and then Monday, Wednesday, Friday versus Monday through Friday. All right, the referral process for PHP and IOP looks like this. Uh, uh, referral will be initiated either by phone call, if it's a, a community referral, or if it's from uh, UCSF Health or even Langley Porter itself, uh, that those referrals need to come in through APEX. That will trigger uh, insurance to be quoted to the patient. Uh, we take most major insurances, uh, and of course they vary by policy. So we have somebody from our registration office reach out to the patient, let them know what their benefits are. PHP and IOP benefits are separate and specific benefits on an insurance policy. So uh, it does make an added layer of of detail and unfortunately confusion, uh, but something that we work with. Um, most insurance companies have what's called a mental health carve out. So even though you might have uh, Blue Shield insurance, they're not going to be the ones administering your mental health benefits. It's going to be a company called Magellan, and then we'll have to get treatment authorized through that company. Uh, so it adds a little bit of layer, uh, a little bit of an extra layer to the process, but something that we're certainly versed in and can help guide and explain. Uh, but that would be the insurance quoting process. Uh, after that, we would schedule an intake ass assessment, and that would just be a, a brief phone call with one of the clinicians to really review uh, the information we have so far, get any updates from the patient, uh, start to think about what, what they would want to work on while they're in the program. And uh, really the treatment starts there, or one could even argue at the call or the referral itself, because there's obviously been a discussion or some thinking put into whether or not even moving in that direction would be a good idea. So intake assessment, and then what we like to do is as close to the intake assessment as possible, schedule a start date, which would be then the admission to the program itself. Um, I picked up a quote from a very recent patient. Uh, we do a patient satisfaction survey uh, for uh, ongoing quality improvement of our program, and this was a quote that one of the patients uh, wrote down for us. They happen to be a, an IOP participant. I would be uh, remiss if I didn't say that we're, of course, having our own challenges with COVID-19 and how to respond to that. I am proud of the team that we had uh, zero interruption in the continuity of care, meaning we, when shelter in place happened mid-March, uh, it, it was a Friday and we made the decision to go 100% virtual and Monday we were somehow able to everybody get on Zoom and coordinate with the patients to get them all on Zoom. Uh, and it was a heavy lift, but everybody came together, really rallied and We've been running since mid-March, 100% virtual. So we do both our PHP and our IOP on Zoom. Uh, so it's telehealth. Uh, I mentioned we just now started having just one giant Zoom meeting where uh, the group leaders can come and go and the patients can stay in there and they can chit chat in between the groups because there's a short break and they can stay in there for lunch if it's a PHP. Um, so just wanted to give a, a brief um, notation to how we're responding to COVID. Uh, in some ways it's helped uh, make 
these services more accessible to patients who might not be able to get to us. Um, certainly it's helped with controlling the pandemic in terms of we're not encouraging people to, to gather in, in w what is a group-based program. So uh, that would be a challenge for us and it will be when we do decide to come back on site. Um, but for the time being, uh, we are planning to continue uh, with telehealth and Zoom for both programs. Uh, we had been talking about referrals, we're still there. Uh, I wanted to talk about some of the main kind of sticking points or obstacles that come up when we're thinking about refer referrals. How do we handle them? I know it's a big um, struggle and demand that we have from the community to uh, meet the, the referrals and, and get those people into our program. Um, so, of course, the number one obstacle is wait times. Um, our, our program is uh, very often heavily impacted, so it does take some time to get patients into either of the program. Um, so wait times, uh, and then uh, some of the, the common situations that we come up with or are up against rather when we are speaking with referrals is that the patient's not ready to commit. Um, it might be a situation where uh, with good intentions, the treatment team on the outpatient level uh, really wants this person to engage in a program like this, and yet the patient's not there yet. And uh, sometimes we'll get all the way to a, an intake, and you saw that process is very lengthy. Um, sometimes we'll get all the way to an intake and the patient's still not ready to, to start the program yet. Um, so that can often be a challenge. Uh, it might have to do with this next bullet about uh, being able to commit to the structure of the program. So the, for the PHP, uh, most, most people are taking a short-term leave of absence. Uh, if they have a full-time job, then it's often a medical leave that's enabling them to come in and do the program. Similarly, if they're a full-time student, uh, they would probably take a leave of absence from their studies. Uh, and then uh, for our IOP, some people will start to return back to work part-time, uh, and that's also by design. It's meant to be uh, a way of being able to work while getting some intensive treatment. Uh, another big obstacle is that many times uh, participants are coming here thinking or wanting uh, individual therapy. And I've really tried to emphasize in this presentation that both programs are group-based. Uh, if somebody's looking for individual therapy, uh, this is not the program to come to. Uh, it's very short term. Uh, the therapists work uh, on very focused goals, knowing that they're only going to work with the client for uh, maybe three weeks for PHP, four to six weeks for the IOP. Uh, and those, those check-ins will only happen uh, about once a week. Um, so it's in addition to the skills groups are really wanting somebody to commit to doing the group work. And then for our program in particular, and this isn't the case for all PHP and IOPs, uh, if somebody is struggling with a primary substance use problem, then uh, because our curriculum doesn't focus on that, uh, we, we would be doing a disservice if we were accepting those referrals. So we do refer out uh, referrals that are coming in needing more of a dual diagnosis focus of treatment. Uh, if, if somebody is interested in referring a patient to the program and they're coming from uh, outside facility or uh, for, uh, you're a community provider, everything is, is handled through our main line and that's this 7,000 number you'll see. For the PHP or the IOP, you'll select one if it's a new patient, and then three for the PHP or IOP. 
And I say one for new patient because if it's an existing patient, say you're a primary care provider, maybe you're a psychiatrist in the clinics, uh, you can refer patients internally through our APEX system. And that's an EPIC branded electronic health record that UCSF Health uses. Uh, if you go into the referral orders, uh, there's a referral called the ambulatory referral to psych-iop and php. That would be what you select. And it actually guides you through a nice decision tree about many of the criteria that we went over in this discussion. I say discussion knowing that we're on Zoom and I'm the only one talking. Uh, so I'm very aware that wait times are a huge obstacle and we're treating people who are in crisis and need help now. So I always freely offer suggestions of other places in the surrounding areas that can also help. Uh, PHPs and IOPs are, are often similarly structured. Uh, so I wanted to offer up just a list that I often refer to when people need help right away and, and maybe we have a significant wait. Uh, we actually don't recommend people uh, be put on a waiting list for our program if we can't get you in within two weeks. Uh, two weeks is a really long time to wait when you're in crisis. And so uh, I emphasize that getting treatment anywhere is and soon is the best way to go rather than uh, get your preferred route of uh, your, your preferred treatment at UCSF. Um, so I freely offer up these other non-affiliated programs. Uh, some of them are in San, some of them are in San Francisco, like the Hope Center or SFDBT. Uh, some of them are in the East Bay, some are in the North Bay, some in the Peninsula. Um, but these can be some great resources. Uh, we've collaborated with some of these, uh, and we share uh, referrals with many. Um, so that's a good resource list to have. Um, I didn't put down their contact information, but you can certainly Google uh, to find out how to get somebody in there. I did want to talk a little bit about insurance authorizations and kind of touched on it a little bit, but uh, we do take most major insurances. Uh, we do offer self-pay, which actually a lot of places don't. Uh, you're kind of either or. Um, you're either fee for service or you take insurances or you're contracted through the county. Like we do, we kind of do everything. Uh, private insurance, self-pay, uh, insurance approval happens typically on somebody's first day. We use the assessment to really gather all the information we need. Uh, it's pre-authorized, so on an ongoing basis, we're asking for uh, the appropriate amount of days based on how well somebody's progressing. I had a referral vignette, but I'm actually gonna skip it uh, so that we can have a little bit of time for some Q&A. Uh, wanted to just make sure we covered our basis in terms of learning objectives, I hope in my talking for the last 45 minutes straight, you have a better idea of what the continuum of mental health care looks like, uh, the difference between a PHP and an IOP, and, and how you might get somebody into our program in particular. If you have uh, more questions on what the program looks like, uh, how to get somebody in, what a typical day looks like, uh, all of that information can be found on our website, which is psych.ucsf.edu backslash LPPHC, that stands for Langley Porter Hospital and Clinics, and then backslash PHPIOP. Uh, not the easiest URL to remember, uh, but if you Google Langley Porter PHP, we're going to come up. So that's another easy way to think about. Let me close my window. Uh, that's what happens when you're next to the emergency room. Uh, so that's how you would find out more information about the program. Um, so we'll stop there. And Dom, if you have any questions, look like we have about eight minutes or so.
Yeah, hi. Uh, just uh, thank you for that, Josiah. One question is, uh, the person's curious if the partial hospital and IOP patients overlap during uh, the groups at all, or are they kept entirely separate? Mm. Great question. Yes. Um, in our first iteration of the IOP, because we've had a, a PHP for decades, we've only had the IOP for uh, maybe three to five years. Uh, we did try to have them all in one group, and then IOP would just piece out halfway through the day, and PHP would stay. Um, so they were very much intermingled. Uh, then we moved to a more structured model where IOP is in one distinct group and PHP is in one distinct group. Uh, when we were on site, they still were able to uh, mingle and, and see each other. Um, now, that, now that both programs are done virtually, they are pretty distinct. Um, so short answer is no, they don't overlap. However, um, because one, one, it's a continuum there, uh, there, there's some natural mingling that happens where a PHP participant might show up in the IOP and maybe maybe they're on different trajectories with some of their peers and um, they'll have little reunions and such. So uh, yes and no. Uh, short answer is no, um, but gave you my long answer. Great. Um, I actually had a question about care transitions, which are always potentially quite challenging, either coming from another level of care into partial, but maybe more specifically exiting partial or IOP back to the home provider, the referring provider or other outpatient. Like what are the challenges there logistically or just clinical risk and how are they addressed? Mm -hmm. A couple things come to mind. Um, in terms of making sure somebody is stable enough to transition, it's always uh, sometimes a matter of opinion where uh, we might think somebody needs more treatment, their insurance might have a different idea, the patient might have a third idea. So we're always trying to balance those different perspectives. Uh, I mentioned we, we, uh, we have a standard where we want to make sure there's an appointment in place um, we also do a lot of safety planning to make sure that, okay, now anticipate the program's not going to be here. You're not going to have a place to touch base uh, once you discharge. What are you going to do? Uh, what sorts of coping strategies are you going to access uh, to make sure that you're able to keep yourself safe? So we'll do things like that, which I think can help with the transition. Um, Oftentimes for the PHP in particular, we have family meetings, so we're engaging the social support network, and so there's other people to help resource that, that person who might be wrapping up in the program. Hopefully that answered your question. Yeah, definitely. Um, well, we don't have any other questions in the chat. Uh, we have a couple more minutes if anyone wants to come off mute and pose a question or put something through the chat. Well, I think we can finish up then with, uh, uh, right. and so uh, certainly I'm assuming you're available if someone has a question they think of after the fact, uh, and you know, feel free to reach out to me if for any point of, uh, as a point of contact, but thank you everyone. Thank you, Josiah, very much for this presentation. Yeah. We'll go ahead and end it. Great. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Tom. All right. Thanks, Nicholas. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.